You'll have to forgive me if I was, well, a little hesitant to do an analysis on the Beastars series. That's not to say I don't love the series, because I do, like, a lot. I've been obsessed with this series ever since I read the first chapter back in August of 2019, and to date, I've read all 170 chapters. Long before it made its appearance on Netflix, I and so many others had already seen the first season in its native Japanese, and we were completely blown away by how well Studio Orange was able to transition Beastars so seamlessly from its manga form by utilizing a unique type of animation that complements this already incredible series perfectly. So then, why would I be so, uh, when it came time to sit down and write a script about one of my top five favorite series to come out, like, ever? Well, to answer that question, and for those of you who have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, first let me give you a bit of background on this masterpiece. Beastars is a 2016 psychological drama manga written and illustrated by creator Paru Itagaki. It was first serialized in Weekly Shonen Champion and would later go on to be picked up for English translation and publication through Viz Media. Beastars would later go on to accumulate no, not four awards like I originally thought, but five prestigious literary awards, including placing only second to The Promised Neverland in 2017 for 2018's Kono Manga Ga Sugoi Guidebook list of top manga specifically aimed at male audiences, winning the 11th Manga Taisho Award and making Beastars publisher Akira Shoten the first series from the company to take that award home, receiving the 2018 New Creator Prize from the esteemed Tezuka Osama Cultural Prizes, with said award being named after, of course, the famous mangaka, often praised in the literary world as the father of manga, the god of manga and the godfather of manga, being named best shonen manga at the 42 Kodansha Awards, and lastly winning a new face award at the 2018 Media Arts Festival. All that said, it's no big mystery how or why this pedigree of a manga could experience such a massive rise in popularity, fame, and cultural recognition. Set to the background of a fictional metropolitan city, the world of Beastars is economically and socially integrated and yet divided by the thin line between carnivores and herbivores. The metaphorical glue barely holding this herbivore supremacist society together are the strict laws put in a place that's supposed to keep carnivores from preying on herbivores and enforcing strict penalties on the crime of predation, i.e. carnivores eating herbivores. Some of the measures taken against carnivores include, but are certainly not limited to, making the act of eating meat a crime, with the exception of the lawless back alley meat market controlled by the Shishigumi Yakuza faction, using medically approved pharmaceuticals and illegal street drugs to weaken the natural strength of larger carnivores such as lions and bears, and encouraging its own form of social distancing by placing strict limits on interactions between carnivores and herbivores, especially when it comes to interspecies relationships. And yes, for those probably wondering and those who have questions, carnivores and herbivores totally have sex. And yes, they produce mixed race children. A gazelle can breed with a cheetah, a horse can get it on with a Komodo dragon, and a six foot wolf can clap the cheeks of a three foot dwarf rabbit. Now what you do with that information? Your own personal business. But that previous paragraph should tell you this video is about to enter the most dangerous of territories. Spoiler territory. I'm giving everyone who doesn't want to spoil B stars in either anime or manga form a major head start to click out of this video. In order to do a thorough analysis of Beastars so far, I'll be delving into the events of the manga. So let's hit that clock and I'll give you five seconds to exit this video. <laughs> Before I cover things a bit more in depth, I want to address the fact that there have been a lot of comparisons and some online drama between Beastars and Zootopia. Just to clear the air, Zootopia could never, and I mean that from both a legal standpoint of Disney being a family-oriented company, when they feel like it, I guess, and a creative standpoint. Zootopia did its best to convey racial and socioeconomic disparities between carnivores and herbivores, but I've always stood by the fact that Zootopia isn't this great da Vinci of social justice narratives. Plus, it loses big points with me for villainizing Meriwether, the overworked all suffering secretary of the city's asshole mayor, especially when they so strongly attributed her with the one universal rule of not touching a black woman's hair. Plus, I feel like it's way too much credit for being the first of its kind to address real-world social injustices using anthropomorphic animals. That's been around for generations, and with the inclusion of Beastars, I really don't see it going away anytime soon. Zootopia was decent enough, I'm just saying Beastars did it better, and that's okay. Now, moving away from Zootopia, <clears throat> at least until we get to the educational furry portion of this video, remember what I just said about Beastars' negative societal views of interspecies relationships? Well, that's the focus of Beastars. We're introduced to our main protagonist, Legacy. And for those wondering why I'm not pronouncing it Legoshi, that's because Legoshi is not just the kanji romanization of his actual name, Legacy, but it also references the Hungarian-American actor, Bela Lugosi. Another fun note about Legacy's design is that his face is modeled after a younger version of the French actor and filmmaker, Matthew Amleric. His overall body and figure is modeled after the Japanese actor, Kenichi Matsuyama. Initially, Legacy is portrayed as a pacifist of a gray wolf who, 
despite his lumbering size and intimidating features, is really just a socially awkward, adorable, oversized puppy with a love of entomology, the capturing and studying of insects. See, look at his little pet stag beetle. Legacy is very self-conscious of his size and his stature, and does his best to shrink himself down in order to make himself seem less intimidating to both society and within his inner circle of carnivore and herbivore friends, to various and comical degrees of failure and success. However, Legacy is no pushover. Woo-woo, second spoiler warning because I'm about to spoil something major about him. Legacy owes his overwhelming strength and power largely in due part to his maternal blood grandfather, a feared and highly respected powerhouse of a Komodo dragon named Gosha. Right up until a certain point in the manga, Legacy even has a combined jaw strength and bite force of 300 kilograms, or a whopping 661 pounds. Not surprisingly, this becomes a major point of perfectly justifiable concern when Legacy finds himself falling in love for the first time with a white dwarf rabbit named Haru. And I just really, really want to go on record saying, I need y'all to get all the way off my furry little girl's back. For all of the Skylar level hate she receives, she's probably one of the best well-written and developed lead female characters I've come across in the last 15 years. And I say this as both a writer and as someone who's studied both psychology and sociology in school and still continues to actively study those subjects and their various mediums independently today. Haru isn't your standard female protagonist. Along with her being utterly despised by both the female characters in Beastars as well as many human viewers of the show, the creator chose to actively portray her as a character that's aware and in total control of her own sexuality. She has a reputation because she's had multiple herbivore partners, a reputation she originally obtained because she slept with the fuckboy boyfriend of this character. What's interesting about this bit of drama is that no one, whether it be the human fanbase or the animals in Beastars, is coming down on said unfaithful fuckboy boyfriend for not only approaching her first, but also for saying he and his girlfriend weren't dating in the first place. Just like y'all are conveniently choosing to overlook the fact that Emo Bambi, one of Haru's lovers and love interests, has a whole ass fiance that he's cheating on. I've even seen the tired argument, well, it's an arranged marriage and it doesn't count because he's in love with Haru. <laughs> Weird hill to die on, given he literally fed her to the lions because it would ensure him a comfortable future in society. And no, it doesn't matter that he came through with the Thule, he chose to do so way too late. If Legacy hadn't been there and if the former leader hadn't taken his time playing with his meal, that'd be the end of her. The funny thing is, Lewis is literally one of my favorite complex characters. But, and as I believe is completely intentional by the creator, she was designed as a perfect testament for how we as society will give all the passes to the male characters for the same behavior we're condemning Haru for. Right now, she is literally the victim of Skylar White Syndrome, another one of the best well-written female characters in existence that people with an elementary understanding of social subtext and character development will go to their graves unjustly hating. And while we're on the topic of things people don't understand but unanimously hate, that finally brings me full circle to the primary reason of why I was so hesitant to talk about Beastars. I knew I wouldn't be able to do a thorough analysis of this series without mentioning the furry fandom. Yes, we've gotten to that part of this video, and if there's anything that the social and cultural reception of Beastars has taught me, it's that people, weebs and otaku especially, still have a lot of misconceptions about the furry fandom. I say this because, as I've mentioned in past videos and live streams, I'm a furry. I even have a fursona. Persona! No, a fursona. By the way, I really just want to say thank you to Sean Northridge for this awesome design of my fursona. Oh, y'all thought I was joking when I said in my review of Interspecies Reviewers that the Futanari furry girl was my favorite part of episode three. See, I bring all of this up for a reason. Ever since Beastars made its way into mainstream media, people have been calling it furry hentai. And just like I also said in that very same review, I'm a massive hentai fan, which, you know, judging from one of the top comments on the video, surprised a few of y'all, I guess. Come on, y'all, it's 2020, literally the year of our Lord Meg the Stallion's knees. Plenty of women, femme, femme presenting, and non-binary black men watch hentai and certainly aren't shy about that fact. That said, I've seen enough hentai, played enough hentai, I've known enough creators of hentai, and I've been thoroughly baptized in the metaphorical bukake that is the hentai fandom enough to comfortably say, Beastars does not qualify as a hentai any more than any other animated series skirting a 17 or up rating featuring mature sexual situations between characters. Now, did I take the long way around just to make that point? Well, no. I bring this up because so many people are genuinely confused about themselves after watching Beastars, yet at the same time are commenting all over Al Gore's internet, oh shit, that's a thick ass bunny, or Legacy or Lewis could break my back like a glow stick. Believe me when I say I have seen these same people perform Olympic level mental gymnastics to convince themselves they are not in any way furry inclined. What has people all hot bothered and confused are the animals for the most part being intentionally designed to look more realistic and less cartoony than their Zootopia counterparts. However, 
for those people struggling, and I'm largely talking to Gen X and millennial weebs and otaku for reasons I'll explain in a minute. What if I were to tell you that for reasons that are psychological, social, and cultural, you've actually been conditioned by all forms of mainstream media to have an interest in, or in some capacity, be attracted to anthropomorphic animals. Now before you nope right out of this video, hear me out. The reason it's so important for people like me with an understanding of complex human psychology to be so out and about about the fact that I'm a furry is for the same reason that it's important for people to know that I'm non-binary and pansexual. Not only does it give people questioning themselves someone who can relate to what they're going through, as well as provide a resource for valuable information and advice, but it also gives people who don't know anything about said topics, but at the same time are still really very curious, and many of you are, an opportunity to learn even if you're just outright uncomfortable or afraid of being shamed for asking questions. And unfortunately, like many aspects of pop and nerd culture, the furry fandom isn't exactly what I'd call diverse. Don't get me wrong, the night I saw Sonic Fox, aka the most famous black furry in pop culture, and one of my personal heroes, accept their award for best esports player in the world at the 2019 Video Game Awards in full fursuit and gave that bomb ass speech, it was an emotional moment. Not just for me, but for all black furries closeted or otherwise. But outside of that, the furry community has a small pool of black and POC fans. And of course, with the public stigma that comes with being a furry, it can be hard for people to ask questions because they're afraid of being judged. I can only speak on my personal experiences of being a queer black furry and what that means to me personally. With that said, let's answer a few questions people often have but are afraid of asking. So, what exactly is a furry? Well, if you were to ask 12 different people, you'd get 12 different answers. The very basic and universally accepted answer is that a furry is someone who takes an interest in, and no, contrary to common misconception, not always in a sexual way, anthropomorphic animals. In other words, animals designed with human traits, features, speech, or mannerisms. There are varying levels of furryism, ranging from people who create their own fursonas, to people who design and make their own fursuits and attend convention with their friends. And yes, just like there are people who have sex and or make porn while wearing cosplay, there are people who enjoy the very same in the furry fandom. And we certainly won't be kink shaming anything that happens between two or more consenting adults, what they do, or how they make their money. People become and enjoy being furries for all sorts of reasons, and explaining each reason will probably be a video for the future, and I'll probably invite some of my furry friends to give their personal input just to make for a more rounded conversation with different perspectives other than my own. But for now, referencing Beastars, if you're wondering how can anyone be subconsciously attracted, especially in a sexual way, to anthropomorphic animals, in the probably copyrighted words of Ryan from Screen Rant's pitch meetings, actually it's super easy. We all know who this is. Lola Bunny, the leading and really only female in 1996's reality crossover film Space Jam. I personally don't know a single person who saw this movie and wasn't attracted to Lola. Lola was intentionally designed to be physically attractive and sexually appealing to young boys, well, no, everyone. It was one of the cruxes of her entire character, along with being the best player on the team next to Michael Jordan. Let's take a peek at Disney's impressive resume of furry fodder, starting with Beauty and the Beast. Do you know how shocked and seen I felt to find out later in life that plenty of people that watched this movie found Beast more attractive prior to his transformation back into a human prince? The next example is like shooting fish in a barrel, and it's one of my favorite all-time Disney movies and sequels, The Lion King. We all know that look that Nala gave Simba. No, you didn't imagine that. Literally, someone at Disney said it's impossible to give bedroom eyes to a cartoon lion. And some animator somewhere was like, bitch, hold my beer, I got this. To this day, I've got grown ass friends older than me who still say Mufasa, Scar, and Simba as an adult could get it. And Disney didn't tone it down for the sequel either. Let's talk about Kovu, the one largely credited for being a lot of millennial and Gen X's furry awakening. If you were attracted to this furry fuckboy as a kid, you can't convince me that you didn't grow up to like traumatize emotionally unavailable guys like Inuyasha, Seshomaru, and Sasuke just to name a few because that list is very long. Even Queen Nala threw those eyes at her own son-in-law. And guess what? Kovu has his own Nala bedroom eyes moment. The difference is he outright says it. And start a pride all our own. And if you still need convincing on how anyone could be attracted to anthropomorphic animals, I'm just gonna point to the recent viral sensation of the Pride Lands fan art, created by Marco the Artist at Masterminds Connect, who was dope enough to grant me his permission to use his art in this video. His Lion King fan art is directly inspired by Beastars, and I think it's safe to say if there were people questioning whether or not they are a furry, this man's art just confirmed it for you. Mufasa looks like a whole snack, Sarabi is dummy thick, Scar looks like the type you'd volunteer to let ruin your life and 
credit score, and once again, we cycle back to Kovu and Nala. He even drew Nala with her iconic look and gave Kovu the classic fuckboy lip bite. And we are just shook over Pumbaa and his Tims. One of my friends said he looks like he's got a whole sugar baby put up in an uptown Chicago apartment. If you're still, still not convinced of the subliminal furry conditioning, remember, many of these characters were very intentionally designed by their creator to have some level of human sex appeal that would make them attractive to their human audience. Here are some very popular examples. Minerva Mink from Animaniacs, Miss Kitty, Miss Sophia Kitty, Gadget, Rebecca, Powerline, Powerline's backup dancers, Pete's wife Peg, Roxanne, Lisa, Sylvia, Captain Amelia, Georgette, Sasha, Rita, and Rouge the Bat. The list goes on. All that said, and to finally bring a close to this video, whether or not you choose to watch or read Beastars this weekend, if you find yourself inexplicably attracted to Haru, Lewis, Legacy, Juno, or any of this incredible cast of brilliantly written characters, well, just blame basic psychology. For the rest of us, I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope it was entertaining, informative, and maybe you even learned a thing or two about yourself. My job here, for now, is done, at least until my next analysis on Beastars and its wild cast of characters.